All right, so again, this week, we're going to talk about economic statement conversion. <clears throat> as I mentioned, this could be one of the challenges that you face this semester as we talk about the conversion of the statements. But what we're going to do <clears throat> is we are going to take income statements and balance sheets and reorganize them to fit into the Medigliani-Miller format. So this is a graphical representation of the Medigliani-Miller model. It was introduced in last week's video. <clears throat> and the general idea is that a company is worth the sum of its future cash flows, and we're going to break those cash flows into what are called operating cash flows and <coughs> excuse me, non-operating cash flows. When we add those two together, that's going to equal the enterprise value of the firm, and it's that enterprise value that can be paid out to the debt and the equity holders of the firm. So in order to help us with this process, we're going to use a mnemonic for each one of those cash flows. So basically, for the operating cash flows, we are going to call these ones. For the non-operating cash flows, twos. The debt equivalent cash flows, threes. And the equity equivalent cash flows, so that 1 plus 2 equals 3 plus 4, right? So operating plus non-operating, 1 plus 2, is enterprise value, or EV for short, and that equals the debt cash flows, 3, plus the equity cash flows, right? Matter of fact, if you go back to last week's video, <clears throat> the enterprise DCF module that we introduced in the valuation of EDCF for enterprise discounted cash flow. It's harder to draw with your mouse. Equals one plus two minus three equals four. So that's going to be the enterprise discounted cash flow methodology we're about to go through. Now, <clears throat> to help us understand what's actually happening here, this is sort of a graphical representation of the process that we're going to spend the rest of the semester on. And so as part of this <clears throat> uh, methodology, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with accounting statements, income statements, and balance sheets and basically map those out to match out the economic statements, which are really mapped to the Medigliani-Miller model. So what this process is really about is to reorganize the accounting statements to match up with the Medigliani-Miller model. Right? And so <coughs> it doesn't matter, <coughs> income statement or balance sheet, which statement we convert first. We're going to have to do both statements, and we can either start with the income statement or we could start with the balance sheet. <clears throat> However, we will need to convert both statements in order to go to the statement of cash flow. So you'll need to do both the income statement and balance sheet to do the cash flow, and then eventually to do the valuations. Right? I'm going to arbitrarily start with the balance sheet. Right? So that'll be the first statement that we're going to convert. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to take a traditional balance sheet and we're going to label it. And we're going to label it 1, 2, 3, and 4. Every item on the balance sheet. And it's almost like if you ever played with a Lego toy where you had a toy made of Legos and you ripped it apart and you put it back together, you can't have any Legos on the floor. So when we rearrange the balance sheet into the statement of what's going to be called total funds invested, or TFI, the, the newly reorganized balance sheet has to balance, and it has to account for every item that was originally on the balance sheet. Okay? So that's going to be very important to our process. So <clears throat> when we go through the balance sheet, we're going to label everything on the balance sheet that's operating a one. And then we're going to net out all the ones, and that's what's going to be called invested capital. So invested capital are basically all of our ones. Then we're going to take all of our twos, all of our non-operating assets, net of any non-operating liabilities. We're going to net those out. 
and then we're going to add the ones and twos, invested capital, non-operating assets, and that's going to get us something called TFI, total funds available to investors. Right. That TFI are the funds that were provided by the debt and the equity holders. So then we're going to look at all the debt. Anything interest-bearing on the balance sheet is going to be debt. We're going to look at any equity, four, three debt, four equity. We're going to add those two together. Three plus four will also add up to be our total funds available to investors or TFI. Okay. <clears throat> when we reorganize the income statement, we're going to reorganize the income statement into a statement called total income available to investors or TII. Right. Now these two statements are not generally accepted accounting principles. They're McKinsey statements that are just mapping to the Medigliani Miller model. So really you're going to really find how to do this pretty much in this textbook. Right. So <clears throat> when you think about TII, the rearranged income statement, we're going to label everything on the income statement, one, two, three, or four. Anything that's operating, one, is going to get us our no plat. Anything non-operating, twos, are going to get us our non-operating income. We add our no plat and non-operating income together, total income available to investors, TII. And that is the income available to pay out the interest expense, the cash flow of the debt holders, the threes, and the income that goes to the shareholders, the fours. All right, so again, the one plus two equals three plus four. Now, <clears throat> once we've converted the income statement and the balance sheet into the economic format, we'll then do our cash flow. <clears throat> statement of cash flow is actually called CFI, which is cash flow available to investors. Cash flow is basically the cash coming from the income statement minus the change in the balance sheet. That's cash flow. So it's the cash generated from the income statement minus any new investment in the balance sheet. We're going to go through that process four times when we do the statement of CFI. Free cash flow, which is the operating cash flow of the firm, is the cash coming from the income statement, the no plat, minus the change in the invested capital, the change in the operating investment in the balance sheet. That is free cash flow. And we're going to add to that all the ones, the non-operating, the twos. So it's going to be the non-operating profit off the income statement minus the change in non-operating investments on the balance sheet. Non-operating cash flows. When we add those two cash flows together, CFI, cash flow available to investors. And it is that cash flow available to investors, the one plus the twos, that are going to equal the threes and the fours. Three, interest expense off the income statement. Payment to the debt holders off the income statement. Minus change in debt on the balance sheet. Cash flow available to debt holders. Finally, cash flow available to equity holders. The dividends that come from the income statement. Minus the change in equity, issuer share buyback, on the balance sheet. Cash flow available to equity holders. 3 plus 4, debt and equity, equals CFI. Equals the cash available to investors coming from the operating and non-operating cash flows. So it is this cash flow from operating and non-operating that is used to pay out these people. If we run a deficit because we're investing, then it's these people that have to fund that deficit. Cash flow available to investors. Right? That, by the way, is going to be the midterm exam. It's coming up in, in a couple weeks, the midterm. No surprises here. I'm going to give you income statements and balance sheets. You're going to come in in an hour and 15 minutes. You're going to get an income statement and balance sheet. You've got to convert it and balance it to these three economic statements. That's part A of the midterm. Okay, Pretty straightforward midterm. What's part, B? part B is going to be multiple choice and short answer. So do you actually understand what it tells you and what we've been talking about as theories? It'll be based off that. It'll be primarily based off of this and anything we've talked about this semester. Okay. Now, after the midterm, 
after you go on your spring break and you come back when we start the valuations, then what we're going to do is we're going to forecast this stuff out. When we forecast out the free cash flows, that's going to be the operating value of the company. When we forecast out the non-operating cash flows, that's the non-operating value of the company. We add those two together, the enterprise value of the company. So if you really think about it, the enterprise value of the company is the forecasted CFIs. The operating and non-operating cash flows combined. And that equals the debt cash flows and the equity cash flows. The forecasted debt cash flows are all the payments and in interest and any change in debt on the balance sheet. The forecasted equity cash flows, any forecasted dividends and change in, in equity on the balance sheet. So again, <clears throat> enterprise value minus debt equals equity. So the really nice part about this process when we do this methodology is a couple things. One, <clears throat> it's more straightforward to the valuations that we do. The accounting statements are not straightforward because the accounting statements leave everything kind of mixed together. We're going to separate it out into the key parts of value. Two, by doing this in a balanced approach, we're going to make sure we get a correct answer. Because if our statements don't balance and we forgot something, then we know we don't have a correct answer. In many other classes that teach valuation, what they'll do is they'll teach you half of the equation and they'll ignore the second half of the equation. And so the problem is by ignoring the second half, you don't know if you forgot anything because you don't really have a balancing where did the cash flow come from and where did it go. I'm going to formally make you do that. So it's extra work, but it means we're less likely to make mistakes. The other advantage of this is once we put it into this format, analysis is very straightforward. Return on invested capital. No plat divided by invested capital. That's my ROIC. Okay. So again, I could very quickly see how the cash flows are actually moving together, and I'm setting myself for, for the types of analysis that we're going to do. Okay. So that's where we're kind of going with all of this. All right. Questions? All right. <clears throat> so our next step is going to be we're going to start with the balance sheet. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're about to do on the balance sheet. If you think about a traditional balance sheet, in a traditional balance sheet, they look at what's called assets equals liabilities and equity. So you can think about it this way. We have assets, and then we have liabilities and equity. <clears throat> balance sheet's got a balance. Now, in a traditional balance sheet, we have what are called current assets and long-term assets. When we reorganize the balance sheet to TFI, we're going to reorganize the balance sheet into what are called operating assets and non-operating assets. Op, non, op. Again, hard to draw with the uh, mouse here. But <clears throat> the point is, is operating assets are going to be tied to the volume of the firm. Meaning, to sell more stuff, this is the stuff we invest in. Non-operating assets have nothing to do with the volume of the firm. They have value, but they're not tied to sales. So, for example, Microsoft is going to announce probably sometime in the next week or so how many initial <laughs> Surface Pro tablets they sold. Right? But Microsoft owns one fifteenth of Facebook. Microsoft owning one fifteenth of Facebook has nothing to do with how much they have to invest to manufacture and sell Surface tablets. Right? So how much they have to spend to manufacture and sell Surface tablets? Operating. Owning another company? Non-operating. They both have value. We're going to independently value them and add them together to get the overall value of the firm. So we're going to break that out. All right. We're going to do the same thing with liabilities. Liabilities are broken out into current and long-term liabilities. We're going to rearrange them into three categories. Operating liabilities, non-operating liabilities, and debt. Debt is anything interest-bearing. Right. And then finally, equity is equity. Equity is the easy one. 
But this, and you can kind of see it more derived in the next page, is basically the rearranging that we're doing. So <clears throat> again, think about the traditional balance sheet. Assets become operating assets and non-operating assets. Liabilities become operating and non-operating, non-interest bearing liabilities. Anything that's interest bearing is debt and equity is equity. This is our rearranged definition of TFI. Okay, so <clears throat> why is there an advantage to this approach? All right, and let me show it to you in Excel. So let's say we had a very simple balance sheet. Change my zoom here so it's a little bit easier to see. We have a very simple balance sheet. And on our very simple balance sheet, all we had was cash. Hundred and thirty six. We had um, inventory and PP and E of twenty, and then we had equity of one fifty six. Just making these numbers up. What's our invested capital? All right. Well, there's two definitions of invested capital. There's the definition of invested capital used by 98% of the rest of the world outside of this class and the definition by invested capital that Bloomberg Pro gave you when you did the Dell exercise for your EIC. All right. The definition that they use is they take the interest-bearing debt and equity, add those two together, and that's called invested capital. Right? Now, in this class, we are going to define invested capital as operating invested capital, which is operating assets minus operating liabilities. What's the difference between those two approaches? Do they give you the same answer? Well, let's go back to my simple company here. If I take Bloomberg and I take their IC, what's the denominator of IC that I would use for Bloomberg? 156. Because what Bloomberg would say is, Investors gave you 156, they have no debt, so just equity. And when you sell more of your products, you're going to keep spending 156 to sell more of your products. If I take the operating ROIC approach, how much invested capital do I really have? 20. Why is it not 136? Yeah. That's right. And what's the 136? It's cash, right? Cash is non-operating. So think about this. Do I need to keep spending that rate of cash to keep building my plants? So every time I build my plant, do I need to raise, you know, basically seven times as much cash as I do for investing in a plant? No, that's not a realistic way of thinking about the business. So by breaking this out into operating and non-operating, it gives us a much clearer picture of what's really required to generate the next sale and how much cash we're really going to make off the next sale. All right? So primarily, what's different about the approach we're going to take is what we're going to do is we're going to have an operating ROIC. What we're also going to have is a non-operating ROIC. And in that case, in the denominator we're going to put the 136. Now, on a weighted average basis, it will give us the same invested capital 
as Bloomberg would tell us, the investing capital is using us the debt and equity perspective. But by breaking it out, it gives us more insight, right? Because if I just use the traditional approach where I just say debt and equity, I leave the non-operating items in, and I assume every time I sell something that I need that rate of return. <clears throat> By the way, the reason I made up these numbers is because Apple had, at, on December 31st, $136 billion of cash in their balance sheet. And Apple had a pretty good ROIC in Bloomberg. But the problem with Apple's ROIC in Bloomberg is it includes a lot of that cash. Because Apple doesn't have any debt. They have equity. So they have all that equity, a lot of it's cash, because they haven't paid out a lot of dividends, financing their business. So when you think about Apple, Apple's got whatever it was, 34, 39% ROIC. And if you go forward, all right, Apple's got 34, 39% ROIC, but Apple's got a lot higher ROIC than that because they don't really have to invest anything in their facilities. They're, they're contracting a lot of that stuff out, especially when you take out all that cash. So you're going to misprice Apple if you just think they have a, a relatively low ROIC compared to what they really have because you leave the non-operating stuff in. So the more stuff they sell, the better they're actually going to do. Right? So that's what we're going to try and get to when we do this analysis. Make sense? Question? When, when we looked at RIC versus uh, WAC for the other companies in previous classes. Same thing. Oh, in previous classes, yeah. Like, did we take a look? I don't, I don't think we like uh, broke down what was operating and not nope. operating. So would it, it would be more advantageous to see what's operating or RIC versus? That's what we're going to say in this class. So <clears throat> I don't want you running to another class and saying, hey, professor, you know, you're making a mistake. It's a different approach. But I will tell you, there's a reason why McKinsey makes a lot of money. And the sophisticated institutions understand this approach. Because it gives you more depth of insight into the real performance of the business. And I'll give you an example. When I was working with Molson Coors a few weeks ago, <clears throat> that was one of the nuances I was really struggling with trying to communicate. Because the message in Molson Coors, if you look at the Bloomberg ROIC, is they have a negative spread. They have like 2 or 3% ROIC against a 6% cost of capital. It looks like they're doing really poorly. But if you look at their operating ROIC, it's actually 17%. So if you look at the Bloomberg ROIC, the message of the company is slash your investment, stop investing, you're doing really poorly. But if you really look at their numbers... <clears throat> They got about two point something billion out of about 10 billion of invested capital listed on Bloomberg, which is the actual stuff that they own. And they got another 7 billion in a joint venture with SAB Miller. So the point is their joint venture with SAB Miller is not doing well. But their actual core brewing operations that they control, where they don't have to split the profits with somebody else, is actually doing pretty good. All right? But I'm just saying you can't have that conversation if you just look at the overall return of the investment, you say you're only making 3%, this is a lousy business. So I'm just saying this is the additional level of insight we're going to try and get into in this class so that we get a better understanding of the value because other classes don't try and map to the Benigliani miller model. And so that's the approach. We're going to give you a consistency. So, <clears throat> But what I'm also going to give you is sort of conceptual consistency so that if you are doing either in another class or at a job and somebody tells you that this is the way you do it, then you'll understand generally what they're trying to accomplish and what you're actually getting. And it may not be exactly what we do in this class, but you at least understand why. All right, so it's not a question of right or wrong because they're different approaches, but I'm just giving you sort of a conceptually consistent approach and understand that everything else is just a rearranged series of formulas based on this. All right, so for example, <clears throat> example I gave to the other class. In October, I was sitting in Los Angeles at a company called AECOM. And their CFO and CEO were giving their conference call live to the investment community. And I was sitting there translating. It was like the universal translator telling the senior managers who weren't in finance like what they were really saying. And one of the things that came up was the concept of free cash flow. <clears throat> and so they were explaining their free cash flow. Well, the definition they're using for free cash flow is basically profit minus CapEx. What it, ex it excludes is investments in working capital. And when we do our ones in just a minute, Working capital is part of invested capital, and therefore, in our, my mind, part of free cash flow. And so they weren't really giving a true representation of what they're investing in their operations because they were kind of ignoring working capital. Next week, when I'm at Rio Tinto, this is going to matter because when you look at Rio Tinto's financials, as I just did over the last weekend, then one of the things you'll see <clears throat> is that they bought back $6 billion worth of debt over the last five years. And the way that they actually generated the cash to pay off the debt 
was they got $6 billion of savings out of their working capital. If they didn't improve their working capital, they couldn't have financed their debt because all their profits went into CapEx. So if they use the simple profit minus CapEx equals free cash flow definition that other companies use, then it looks like they're not generating any excess cash to pay off their debt. And you'd say, well, gee, how are they paying off their debt? It must be smoke and mirrors. But the reality is they've made some hard-won improvements in working capital, which freed up enough cash to basically pay off their debt. So by putting stuff in the format that we use here, it gives us far more insight. And so that's what I'm going to kind of stress that we do. But that's after the midterm. Before the midterm, we've got to walk before we can run. Now it's about how do we put things into this format. So as I said, we're going to start with the balance sheet first. So in the book, in the readings that you did for this week, simple balance sheet. Balance sheet on the left, gap balance sheet. Balance sheet on the right, TFI. Got to convert it. Now the next step, <clears throat> I told the last three classes, I'll, I'll mention this as well, and this is on the video. So, matter of fact, I was just reading over the weekend that a student just sued her professor because she got a C in the class and she said it destroyed her life. All right. So I'm on record saying, if you get a C in the class for making the mistake that I'm about to tell you, it's on record that I told you not to make this mistake. So you can't sue me for this mistake. All right. So this is the difference of how people get on a 20-point midterm an 8. Okay, so don't get an 8 on your midterm. The very first step in this process is to label these statements 1, 2, 3, and 4. The labeling process that I'm describing in this class is not in the book, doesn't exist on Google, doesn't exist anywhere else besides me here at the University of Maryland. And the labeling process comes from, in the 90s, I used to teach in the analyst training program at McKinsey, where they bring in some really smart students who had no knowledge of business. So they'd hire liberal arts majors and people from physics majors and other degrees and take any business classes. And in a five-week period of time, gave them an immersion so that they could actually understand business. And I had one week to do corporate finance. And I had three hours to do what we're going to do in the next five weeks. So I had to take people who could care less about financials and teach them how to do all this stuff in three hours. And I found that this labeling process helped. Right? So again, you could ignore my advice, but I'm telling you, particularly when you're starting the process, the labeling will assist you, cause you to make less mistakes, and it'll give you a better understanding of what's going on. So the very first thing I strongly encourage you to do, anytime you get statements to convert this semester, label them one, two, three, or four. Put a little one, two, three, or four right by them. So let's go through this simple balance sheet on the left, and let's label these items. <clears throat> so let's start out with Inventory. One, two, three, or four. Inventory. Operating, non-operating, debt, equity. Operating. Tied to sales, operating. I need more inventory to sell more stuff. Net property plan and equipment. <clears throat> operating. I need more facilities to sell more stuff. Equity investments. We own shares of other companies that we don't control. Non-operating. Dell owns one fifteenth of Facebook. Right? Again, they have value, just not directly, re or sorry, Microsoft owns one fifteenth of Facebook. Not directly associated with Microsoft, but there's value to it. Non-operating, too. Got to value that. Accounts payable. We owe a supplier in 30 to 45 days for stuff they gave us to help build our products that we don't have to pay them immediately for. Operating. Because generally accounts payable, there's no interest associated with it. You pay them in 45 days, you don't pay any interest on it. They're not like a bank loan. So it's considered an operating liability. Interest-bearing debt. Three. That is interest-bearing. You pay it in 30 days, you owe 30 days worth of interest. Debt equivalent. Common stock at par value. That's equity. Shareholders are providing equity to fund your business. Retained earnings. Both of those are fours. Retained earnings is income that we made that we are reusing of shareholders' money that we didn't pay them in the form of dividends. Therefore, it's equity. It's like new equity investments by shareholders. Okay? So that's equity. So common stock and retained earnings are both fours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to Excel. <clears throat> it be easier to see what's going on here in Excel. Now, when I give you your homework assignment, 
and your midterm exams. I'm going to give you a spreadsheet. And as I said, I'm going to recommend that you create this category over here called label. It's column. And that you put in the one, two, threes, and fours. So inventory one, property plan equipment one, equity investment two, accounts payable one, debt three, common stock retain earnings four. Those are the four categories. Okay, there won't be any new categories. It's one through four. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm also going to recommend that you do it in Excel, and every time you create something, you create a new tab or a new worksheet. So again, I'll change my zoom here. So <clears throat> I'm going to take my, and I'll relabel this, call this uh, TFI section 401. 401, and this is the one for the video. Move it closer to where I can see it. All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to start taking all my ones. I'm going to put them together. So inventory, PP&E are ones, and accounts payable is also a one. So invested capital is all of my asset ones minus my liability ones. So in this case, 375 and 425. So on your next graded homework assignment, on your midterm exam, that would be a correct answer for invested capital. All right, so that's basically how much money was invested in the operations of the business for those two years. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a quick change here where I'm going to take PP&E and move it so that I have what's called Work operating working capital, which is my current ones netted. And I'm going to add that to my long term ones. So working capital plus PPE is also invested capital. Now I get the same answer. What's going to happen is when we eventually do valuation and we start forecasting out companies' financials. We're going to want to forecast out, for example, levels of inventory separately than levels of facilities. We're not going to forecast them at the same rate. So rather than just forecasting invested capital, we're going to forecast out working capital separately than long-term investments. So I'm going to go ahead and set up our little spreadsheet with that in mind. But for purposes of invested capital, if I mix my short and long-term ones together, I still get the correct invested capital. And for your first assignments, I'm just going to carry that you understand what's actually invested capital. All right. So it's anything that's an asset one minus anything that's a liability one. I net them out. That's my invested capital. Questions? All right. I'm going to then add in anything that's non-operating, anything called a two. So in this case, equals, what do I have labeled as a two? Equity investments. One plus two, total funds available to investors equals IC plus equity investments, TFI 390, 450. This is what I invested in my operations. This is what I invested non-operating. That equals my threes and my fours. My threes, debt, my fours, equity, when I sum my threes and my fours, 390 matches 390, 450 matches 450, notice my ones, 
twos, threes, and fours are also bunched together. Gives me comfort. I'm less likely to make a mistake when I see that. All right. So again, by putting everything in the format, I know that here's how much I had invested in my business, and I know that I needed that much financing to fund that investment. That's what TFI is about. Here's how much I put into operations. Here's how much I put into non-operating activities. The two together is my total investment in my business. Very clean way of reorganizing the balance sheet. By the way, the other reason I recommend doing the labeling, let's say that for whatever reason, I forgot to put common stock in my rearranged TFI. My statement no longer balances. So as far as the midterm goes, that's an incorrect answer. So even though you have one of the two numbers right, 390 and 340, you don't know which one's right. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to tell the TAs not to give you credit. So the only way that you get credit is if everything balances. So you're going to have to do every statement and show both sides and show that they add up to the same number. If you don't, then you don't have a correct answer. Right. Now, here's where labeling can help you. <clears throat> I noticed that when I go back to my original data, I had two things labeled as a four, but on my TFI, I only have one thing as a four on my statement. I got a Lego on the floor. Right? So by labeling, it will help you when you start to identify, because your two common mistakes initially are going to be either did I forget to put something on the statement or did I put it in the wrong place. Those are going to be the more common mistakes. So I don't want a two mixed in with my ones, and I don't want to leave a four on the floor. So in this case, I put my four back in, everything balance, there's peace in my world. And the reason why this is going to be very important is on your midterm, you're going to have an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to give you an income statement with probably 20 categories. I'm going to give you a balance sheet with 20 to 25 categories. There's going to be three or four years of data. You're going to have to get all of this matched and balancing in an hour and 15 minutes. And when you're sitting there with five minutes left before I pull the plug and nothing balances, you'll appreciate the labeling process. Right? Because it's going to be what helps you figure out what's missing, if something is missing. Hopefully you won't have that problem. Yes? Um, how would you label like minority interest? I'm, this might just be because I have like, trouble understanding that, but I feel like it's a liability, but at the same time it's like an equity investment kind of thing. Okay, so minority interest on the balance sheet. So in, the, in that case, GE's ownership of NBC Universal. The GE, it's a minority interest because Comcast controls it. Yeah. So from a Comcast perspective, from a GE perspective, it's an asset, it's an equity investment. From a Comcast perspective, it's a minority interest, which on the balance sheet is either a liability or an equity. Now here's the thing. Minority interest is equity because it represents the ownership stake of Time Warner but it's a liability to those equity holders. So technically you could call it a three or you could call it a four. All right, we're gonna call it equity, so therefore we're gonna call it a four. When we do a cost of capital, we're actually gonna break out the common equity from the minority interest and value those independently. So really it's kind of a quasi between a three and a four. And for purposes of this class, if you labeled it a three or a four, it really wouldn't matter what would be matter is how you valued it separately than the common equity. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But this is the stuff we'll get into probably more after the midterm when we deal with these valuations. Other questions? That was a good question. All right. So we've now rearranged our balance sheet. What we're now going to do is we're going to rearrange the income statement. So I'm going to create a new tab. Section 401 TII, it's the one we're using for the video. <clears throat> All right, same idea. I'm going to copy this over. All right, I need to label my income statement. So again, I'll go in the book. 
And by the way, there's examples of uh, common categories the book talks about in the next slide. All right. I have the accounting simple income statement on the left, reorganized TII on the right. One, two, three, and four, starting with revenue. What is that? One, two, three, or four? One. One. That's operating. Operating costs. Depreciation. Where does depreciation come from in the balance sheet? What did we call PPD in the balance sheet? Therefore, in the income statement, it should be consistent. It should also be operating. So items that we label on the balance sheet need to be consistently labeled on the income statement. So if we labeled minority interest to four in our balance sheet, going back to the previous question, and we reported the minority interest stake on our income statement, what should that be labeled? A four as well. Interest expense. Again, where does it come from on the balance sheet? Interest bearing debt. We label that a three. The interest according to that should also be a three. Non-operating income. Where did that come from on the balance sheet? Where did the non-operating income come from? Came from the equity investments. So the equity investments on the balance sheet generate the non-operating income on the income statement. Taxes. It's a trick. It's a one. It's a two. And it's a three. What we're going to do is we're going to split out the tax effects into each one of the areas. We're going to end up with the same taxes, but we're going to look at the tax effect on each of the areas in the firm. So it's a one, a two, and a three. All right, so let's go back to our simple spreadsheet here so and see what's going on. One shortcut that I'm going to allow you to take is operating profit. Generally, on your midterm and on your homework, everything above operating profit is operating. So rather than writing down every single category, you can start with operating profit as your ones, net of all the ones. I'm not going to let you take many shortcuts, but that's one of the shortcuts that I'll let you take. All right, so therefore, <clears throat> in our simple example here, Operating income is a 1, interest was a 3, non-op 2, tax 1, 2, 3, and net income was 4. Okay, so net income goes to the shareholders, shareholder money is a 4. Matter of fact, where does net income go on the balance sheet? Retained earnings, which we also called a 4 in the previous statement, just for consistency standpoint. All right, so again, I'm going to rearrange this, take all my ones. My ones would be my operating income, my shortcut. Now, I'm going to have to pay taxes if that's all I reported was 280, 280 million, let's say. Taxes on my operating income. This company pays a 25% tax rate. So I take that times 25%. That would be my taxes on my operating profit. My no plat or no pat equals 280 minus 70. Again, for the midterm and your homework, I'll give you the tax rate. What you're going to have to do later in your group projects is you have to figure out what the company's tax rate actually is. All right. <clears throat> so that's how much money we're making from operations. Next. Non-operating profits. Non-operating profit was four. Assuming that's all we reported, we'd have to pay tax on the non-operating income equals that times 0.25. So that our after-tax non-operating income Four minus one. Or sorry, four minus that one. Three. Now you notice in the book that the person that did this chapter was a little lazy. Because they knew 
they needed to calculate an after-tax non-operating income. And they didn't show you that what they intuitively knew <clears throat> was that the company had four of non-operating income. They would have paid one in taxes, and they would have netted three of after-tax non-operating income. Now, if you are that sophisticated with these statements already, it's perfectly acceptable to just write out the after-tax non-operating income. But when you're just getting started, <clears throat> I find it useful to write all these things out. So I know what's going on. I had four of a pre-tax income, <clears throat> paid to one in taxes, three of after-tax income from non-operating activities. Right? So I guess it's clearer for me, and I recommend you do that as well as to what's going on. When I add my ones and twos together, <clears throat> total income available to investors, 210 plus 3, 213. <clears throat> I generated 213 in income. Right. It is this income available to investors that I then distribute to my debt and equity holders. Interest expense, 20. Tax shield on the interest <coughs> equals 20 times 0.25 because I can write off the 20 as a cost of doing business. Therefore, my after-tax interest expense, 20 minus 5 or 15. Fours, my net income, 198. I take the 15 I gave to the interest holders. I take the 198 I gave to the shareholders. 213 matches 213. Total income available to investors' balances. But notice <clears throat> what I now know about this company. I now know a few things. One, I notice <clears throat> this company generated 213 of profit from its income statement and distributed 213 to the investors. Now this is where it gets a little tricky because this is not accounting and this is not the accounting statement of cash flow. This is a McKinsey statement. And the McKinsey statement says we're going to balance the income available to investors. So this second half of the statement is called funds flow, or financing flows, and the profits equal the financing flows. I generated 213 in profit. I distributed 213 to my investors. In order to get the statement to balance, the distributions are positive numbers. I had 213 in profit. I gave 15 to the debt holders. I gave 198 to the shareholders. The distribution to the debt and the equity are positive numbers. Outflows are positive. If the opposite had happened, if I lost money, I would have lost shareholder money. I would have needed shareholder money to fund my losses. A negative profit, a negative financing flow. The two sides have to balance. That's what I'm trying to reconcile. If I had cash, where did it come from? Where did it go? If I needed cash, where did, why did I need it? Where did it come from? I'm syncing up the two sides of those statements. That's just something you're going to have to wrap your head around because if you kind of miss that point, you're going to really struggle with these statements. Because right? you have the opportunity to just randomly put in numbers until everything balances. All right? But if you don't understand why you're adding and subtracting things, you'll be really frustrated in the rest of this class. All right? So <clears throat> this is the balance statement of TII. This would be considered a correct answer with both sides. Now. I mentioned about taxes, and I said we can't leave any Legos on the floor. Before we reorganize the statement, how much did we pay in taxes? What did the firm actually report in taxes? 66. Let's look at the taxes of the firm. From operating activities, how much did the firm pay in its operations? 70. How much did it pay in non-operating activities? What's 70 plus 1? How much of a tax yield did it get? What's 71 minus 5? 66. The same taxes that the company paid. So that's the point. We still end up with the same taxes, but we now have more insight. So go back to last week's video in APV. Present value of the, uh, <clears throat> the tax yield. If this company didn't have debt in its capital structure, Somebody asked me what kind of question you might get on the midterm off of this. If this company didn't have debt in its capital structure, 
how much would it be paying in taxes? 71. 71. So what's the value of the debt? Five. And if they keep the debt into the future, forecast that out, discount it, that's the present value of the debt. That's the t present value of the tax shield. That's the gift from the government. So again, it's exactly what the APV model is based on. That's the advantage of this format. Once we put everything in this format, it makes the analysis easy and very straightforward. Questions? All right. Matter of fact, the other thing I'll leave you with is return on investment. <clears throat> what is the return on invested capital of this business? Well, here's one other nuance that's going to be very important. When you just did the Bloomberg assignment, Bloomberg actually uses a different ROIC than what we're doing formally in this class. Because Bloomberg bases the ROIC on what? What did we say earlier that Bloomberg bases the ROIC on? How do they define invested capital? And most of the rest of the world. It's the return on the debt and the equity. Interest-bearing debt and equity is their definition of invested capital. So, even if they had done the same no-plat as we do, so this is the Bloomberg ROIC. They take the no-plat and they divide it by what? TFI. What we call TFI. Because they're dividing it by the debt and the equity. So what they're really doing is Bloomberg calls it ROIC, but what it really is is an ROTFI. ROTFI. Right? That's what the rest of the world does. 47%. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, in this class, operating ROIC. What is the operating ROIC? It's the 210 from operations divided by what? The invested capital, which is a rate of 49%. But here's the difference. We also, in this class, can do a non-operating ROIC, which equals what? The non-operating profit divided by the non-operating assets, 12%. So here's the thing. Bloomberg's kind of doing a weighted average of the firm. So if you use the Bloomberg approach and the company sells more products, what return would you expect? What return on investment would you expect? Now, if you use the Bloomberg approach, the return on investment you expect is 47. But what's the real return on investment on the operations of this company? So Bloomberg, if you follow that approach, you're going to under or overvalue the firm. You're going to undervalue the firm. Because the return on their non-operating assets is only 12%. And it's blended in to the rest of their assets when they looked at the denominator of debt plus equity. And I'm just telling you, every other class you've ever taken at Smith, that's what they do. They leave them in together. And they mix the operating and the non-operating together. And the reason why, for the most part, is they say, well, most companies don't have much in the way of non-operating stuff. But in today's world, that's starting to change. Like I said, look at a company like Apple. It's got $130 billion worth of cash. Look at a company with Microsoft. It's got $60 or $70 billion worth of cash. Look at the big pharmas. Look at companies that have investments in other firms. Look at Molson Coors, which has $7 billion invested in a joint venture with SAB Miller, as opposed to $2 billion and change invested in their actual business. And you will start mispricing some firms. And so this is going to be why we're going to really have to take the time to do this because it gives us better insight as to what's happening in the firm. And it doesn't mean we don't value the assets. We just break it out. We say we have an operating value, which is not going to be the same, not going to grow at the same rate as the non-operating value. But that will give us, hopefully, a better valuation. Right? This is where we're going to pick up on the next session, which will also be the next video.